beautiful table, right? Now, each company is making different kind of choices and they are trying to assess the performance of the process or do some marketing and things like that, which is not very important for us. Now the question is, what can we do more than what we just saw? And the answer is that we looked in the main issues, which are enabling high performance, but there are more things like you can do the same kind of renaming or uh, solving the dependencies which are not real dependencies in the memory. Because in the same way you have dependencies like write after read or write after write in read registers you have in memory as well which will preclude you to do things faster on the memory. You can do that too. What else you can do? You can do things which we didn't discuss, but those are on the compiler side, optimizations. You know, I have a loop. The loop will execute 10 times, and my machine has a lot of resources. The compiler may decide to instantiate the loop four times, like sequential, and to loop it four times per iter four iterations per time, less times, then I have more instructions to execute. <coughs> now, this is something which it's on the side of the enemy, you know, the compiler people. But it's enemy in the wrong way because people from compiler and architecture should work together. It's like in embedded system there are it's it's a very typical kind of discussion. I'm a hardware designer. I do not care about software. I'm a software programmer. I do not care about hardware. And in embedded system, this is actually the key. If the hardware designer is making the architecture and the facilities in order to make the life of the programmer better, and the programmer provides some kind of insight in what she or he wants, the system as an entire will function better, okay? But people are trying to protect their field. Now, remember prediction. Prediction was good, speculation was good. And now you can predict and speculate whatever you want. The better you are in prediction, the better the performance. And Speculation can be on address, can be on data values. And last but not least is the utilization of multi-threading. Then I was executing a thread of the program and that has limited parallelism. If I can assume that my program is launching threads which are in parallel, I can fill my functional units with instructions for more than one thread. We'll see that in, this, in a sec. That's that will occupy more resources, but things are getting, you know, a bit more complicated. Then, assuming that those are my functional units. If I only execute one thread, from time to time, some units will be out idle. This is the execution, <coughs> right? Then I have four functional units, and each row means actually a cycle. Now, I can say that my program has threads which can be executed in parallel. Then I'm moving now the parallelism at even a higher level. Then the granularity of the parallelism now is going from the instruction level to the thread level. If my processor <coughs> will be able to handle the threads in an independent way, now I can choose in the same cycle to execute instructions from different threads. Then I have the red, the blue, and the green, and each of them is doing different things. And I can schedule them in parallel, and what you see is that I'm utilizing the resources in a more effective way. But there is a cost for that. You know, if I have to speak with one student, it's easier than if I have to speak with three students in the same time, all of them are talking, 
right? And I should be able to do things like Napoleon. You know Napoleon to do that. You don't know who Napoleon is. You should have asked me which of them, the first or the third. Hmm? Wasn't it Caesar that did multitasking? Uh, but that was a long time ago. Sure. <laughs> I'm not sure about Caesar, but I'm sure about Napoleon. That is well documented. Mm. <coughs> we speak about the first Napoleon, you know, the one that most of the people know. Even though the Napoleon III did actually a lot of good things for Europe. Not all the people will agree with me, but that's, you know, that's the beauty of uh, debate. Now, in order to do that kind of trick, you have to make the story even more complex. But now, you see, as long as you separate the problems and you deal with them in a kind of orthogonal way, things are nicely structured <coughs> and you can keep coherence. If you try to put all of them together and treat them in not a very well formalized and organized way, then things will get wrong. Now, what you do here is you rely on instruction level parallelism and you have a mechanism to deal with that. And when you, when you look now, you concentrate on the threats. And you assume that the instruction level parallelism business is dealt with in a proper way. And you concentrate only on that. And now, you will have to have facilities, extra facilities for the threads. Each thread should have a register file, a program counter, and things like that. Now, <coughs> my program may have two threads now, four threads later, and then only one thread, and things like that. Then there is certain thread level parallelism in the application too. We, we can call those threads also tasks, but okay. This is a bit confusing, but the difference between a thread and a process or a task is that the thread has some high, how less status around. But let's forget about that for now because this is another complication. Then if I can handle the threads in a clean way, I'm enabling more parallelism. I may not have enough resources to handle all the available threads in a program. Then I do some kind of round robin and things like that. This may help me to do things. But there is, you know, all the good parts, they have the bad parts. Because I'm executing now instructions from different threads, I may have a problem with the cache. As you will see, we will discuss about caches immediately, I think, or if we finish this, we go for caches. In a cache, you know, the cache is kind of trying to capture the behavior of the program and to provide data which are used by the program or instructions in a way which will hide the latency of the main memory. Now, if the cache has different requirements from different threads, there are conflicts and I'm getting pollution. Then from one point of view, I am doing better because I have more parallelism due to the thread parallelism. From the other <coughs> point of view, I have things which are popping up in different places in my computer. And I have to deal with them in, in, in that area. And this is cache interference. And <coughs> I can solve that. I can partition the cache per threads. But this also requires some extra mechanism. Then any kind of solution has a cost. And it's very simple as long as you can sell the product, you do good. Okay? And by selling the product, I don't mean you sell the product, you sell your idea in our case, right? And one other thing which may have very important, and most of the architects are not making good assumptions on that, are the implications on the cycle time. Because when I'm making things more complex, I may increase the cycle time. 
And an increase in the cycle time means that each and every instruction will be penalized with that. Then I have to count what I'm losing, <coughs> what I'm winning. Okay, now this is a machine that is well known, the Pentium 4, and those are the things which are used in the Pentium 4, hyper pipelining, hyper threading, improved cache, beautiful things, which are making the machine very complicated. You know, if we look careful, we'll see all the things that we know in here, in this processor. But they are more complicated and, and there are other things, you know, which are required <coughs> in order to deal with the specifics of the architecture and the instruction set architecture. And I will not go in many details, but one thing that I would like to comment on is that this is a strange machine. From the instruction set point of view, I have a complex instruction set. And it's like an old time machine when instructions were complex and they were taking more cycles, different cycles. And the program was more compact because I had less instructions, but each instruction was more powerful. powerful. Now, this is as you see it as a programmer. From the inside, what's going on is that each instruction which is complex, it's actually trans transformed in a micro program because inside this machine it's a risk machine that you can, then it can execute simple instruction with fixed delay cycle time additions multiplications whatever but no complicated instructions on strings or other things probably you never did you ever see the <coughs> assembly program of this kind of pentium no? X86, it's the architecture which is from 80s. When were you built? 80s. 80s, then <laughs> you are kind of the same age. Then there's the basic architecture. And Intel improved and improved and improved it and arrived to this kind of emulation. Now, in order to deal with that emulation, you know, when you get an instruction, you have to do a lot of things. Now you also see a cache hierarchy here. You see that the functional units are actually <coughs> split in classes, you know, complex functions, uh, arithmetic units and simple arithmetic units. And on the red one, you also see what is called the, ca the, trash, the, the trace cache. We'll discuss about that immediately. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I can spend here the half an hour, but will that be relevant? I think not. You can look at it and try to see, <coughs> identify the blocks and think about why they put it there. Okay, now I told you that. Now let us talk a bit about the trace cache. This is the execution of a program. Then I'm executing green, then I have a branch, I'm executing magenta, <coughs> then I have a branch, and then I'm executing blue. Is that magenta or purple? Magenta. Purple. What's the difference between magenta and purple? The name. The name only? <laughs> no. Should be some more. The girls should know that. Usually boys are colorblind. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> hmm? Purple has more red. Hmm? <laughs> okay. Now, this <coughs> is what I'm executing as a program. But this is where the code is located in the cache. And you see that when I'm busy with green, I'm in this line of, you know, instructions are in that cache line. After the jump, I move, it, move in another place, and then I move in another place. Then essentially in my execution, I will have to move in the memory, in the cache, in different lines in order to get the instructions. Each time I'm moving, I'm getting a miss, most likely. Or maybe not, but the chance is large. Now, what the trace cache is doing is saying, you know, I'm learning while the program is executed. Then instead of looking in the cache 
I'm looking in another cache where I memorize the way the instructions are executed in at runtime. Then I have a layout in the instruction cache, which is related to the <coughs> static distribution of instructions and to the way I'm bringing information from the main memory or whatever. And then at runtime, I'm building this kind of things. First time, I don't have it. But let us assume that I have <coughs> that in, in a loop. And I'm coming back again and again and again. Then I build this. And next time when I'm executing this instruction stream, I'll be in the same line. I bring, you know, I may have to bring, you know, the, the first line somehow. And then I have the rest also then. It's pre-processed. Now, this costs something, and it's not effective if this is not repeating. Then those jumps in the cache are avoided by that construction. Okay, and some processors use this. Now, the efficiency of this is large. Whenever you will execute this trajectory in the program a lot of times. Otherwise, the overhead to create it may be larger than the advantage. Hyper-pipelining. hyper marche You know, you have super marche <coughs> hyper marche You don't have hyper marche in the Netherlands, right? No. hyper marche Nobody is from France. No? On a part of the France, see? No? Nobody speaks English? No, French, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I combined the two questions. And it went in the wrong way then. Nobody can speak French? No? Oh. Then I can swear in French. <laughs> I will not understand. <laughs> ah, ah. No. Then, super pipelining or hyper pipelining, it's actually splitting the work in more fine grain stages and you have more of that and this is the way the pipeline of the Pentium 4 is looking as you see there are 20 stages now each of those is doing something personally I don't think I would like to talk about each stage what it's doing it's not really the purpose of this discussion but what you can see that there are stages which are doing nothing, like drive. This is a bit counterintuitive, but it deals with the current technology. Drive means <coughs> I'm letting the signals, the time to propagate over wires from a location to another. In old technologies, <coughs> nobody would have thought about that. But today, in a big chip, sending information from this corner to this corner may take more than one cycle. Then if you see things like drive do nothing by transfer signals, you should not be surprised. It would have been very strange to see that in a processor from the 80s, but not here. In today's technology, the time required for propagation is essentially dominated by the wires. But doesn't it usually go the other way? So Which you, way? You, you choose the cycle after you see the propagation delays and everything. Yeah, but if you do that, no, no, it's the propagation of the wires. It's not the propagation through the logic. Yeah, but you do both when you calculate. Yeah, but if I do that, then I will explode my, my cycle time. Mm. Then Traditionally, when we look at the logic, we say, okay, this is my logic. I'll count the levels. On each level, I have gates. I know the delay of the gate. I multiply it with the number of levels, and this is the delay. And we used to disregard the wires. Today, we have to consider them. And the analysis is actually done at low level, electrical simulation, spy simulation where I have the wires, and those are determining the delay. Now, if I want, I can embed the delay of the wires in the calculation, in the my stage, it's fine. 
If I cannot, I have to allocate a cycle. And I will allocate a cycle whenever I'm sending values from one place to another place, which is far away. Then I have to know a bit about the floor planning of my uh, architecture. Okay. Okay, other things, you know, there is a cycle for flex, which is computing the flex. Then this is good because this is enabling high frequency. Each of those stages is short and simple. But whenever I do something wrong, I have to flush a lot of things in a long pipeline. Don't do that. It's bad for your joints. <laughs> when you will be not old, but more mature, <laughs> your hands will do like that. <laughs> oh, okay. This is a comparison on uh, four to three. Okay, then basically we arrive to the end of the discussion on superscalar and uh, what we see is that the evolution was pushed by the technology and by the techniques which were developed. Some of them long time ago, some of them are more recent. And um, the technology is in the saturation. Also, there are some limitations, conceptually speaking, of what we can do. Then the question is, what's next? Now, I will not answer to that question because we have a tendency to kill the prophets, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> then I don't want to be killed. Do you know what I'm referring at? No. Mm. Nobody knows? No? A movie or something? I heard. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> you know, Europeans are building on kind of mosaic culture. Then it's Christianity. Okay. Then, and in that kind of cultural, you know, descendancy, we speak about prophets. One <coughs> of them being Jesus Christ, which was killed. It's not the only one, you know. It happened also in the, um, in the Greek history. You know, Socrates was killed. He was a prophet. He was a prophet in a certain way. He was not a religious prophet, but he was a prophet in a different sense. No, but you know, that was meant to be a joke, but jokes can be understood if we share the same culture, right? If we don't, it's a bit more difficult. But anyway, now you understand, I hope, okay? Now, then what will happen next depends very much on technology. And there is an avenue which may be a real breakthrough, which is quantum computing. If quantum computing will become reality, many of those things will go, you know, into the museum. Whether or not this will become reality, it's a different story. We have emerging technologies which do have different behavior than FET transistors. All the things that you know <coughs> in logic design rely on switches. And we started with the vacuum tubes, which were switches, or with relays even, which were mechanical switches. Then the reason for <coughs> that was the algebra of Mr. Bull, which has a natural marriage with switches. And then we went through different technologies. We got to the FET transistor, which is a nice switch. CMOS technology, which is beautiful because at least in theory, there is no static current, which used to be the case, but today we have large leakage. But essentially, there is a kind of saturation in the, in the MOS. It doesn't mean that the MOS will disappear. But if I change the basic building block, and if I do calculation based on something else but the switch, which means I use a different algebra, I may get more powerful calculations. Okay? And there are different avenues to follow. You know, it's multi-value logic. 
<coughs> naturally inspired computing. We are looking around. We are trying to find a way. We are trying to get inspiration from the nature. We are trying to get inspiration from the way we think. <coughs> people are looking in artificial brains also. On the way the molecules are interacting, and we look in chemistry. Then, whenever you will get my age, the landscape in computer architecture may look very much different. Okay. But who knows? For the time being, what we have to do is we push, we push, we push, we push, and the push now is more in multi core. And we kind of know how to do instruction level parallelism, data level parallelism, thread level parallelism, application level parallelism. And because silicon is a commodity, it's very cheap, we put a lot of cores. We'll discuss a bit on that also. Now, before finishing the story, I have three slides, I guess. This is about the implications of the precise interrupts in the instruction scheduling. Then it's a dynamic scheduling with a simple pipeline. And what you see is that even if I could write back results earlier <coughs> and then complete the execution faster, I would have to wait for the write back in order to have precise interrupts. And this is a price that you pay in order to have a good status of the processor. Now, that's because of structural hazards, right? No, there are no structural hazards. You just want, the, here there are structural hazards. You just want to keep the status of the processor as it would have been executed a sequential program with no changes. And then you have precise interrupts. Now, in here, we have the consequences of a structural hazard. In one case, we have two floating point multipliers. In the other case, we have one floating point multiplier. And you see the execution is also different. One thing which you have to try to understand in here is the fact that there is result forwarding. Then instructions are getting results from previous <coughs> instructions via forwarding mechanism then I don't have to, to wait for the right back. And then if you look at those schedules, you'll see where this is actually helping. Now, this is the last slide on this part, and it's about register renaming. And just to give you a hint on how register renaming is done, which is now different than from some point of view than Thomas Solo. What is happening is we have a simple example. Is that we have all the logic registers in the processor are actually assigned to physical registers. And at a certain moment in time, the status of the processor can be like here. You know, the architected registers, which are R0 to R4 with small letters, are what the programmer is seeing. The other registers are physical registers. And the register renaming mechanism is keeping that translation table update, up to date, while executing instruction. Then I am getting now this instruction. It's actually, you add to R3, R4, and you store the result in R3, okay? Now, this is the status of the the, the registers whenever you get this instruction. <coughs> what will happen is that you will need to assign to the output register, to the R3, a different physical register, you know, in order to solve the non-true dependencies. In this moment in time, if you look at R3, it's, get, it's assigned to the physical register L1. And then when you prepare the instruction for the execution, what you will actually execute in hardware, it's add R1 with four and store the result in R2. Those are your physical registers. Then the output register 
was taken, I had no assignation for it, then I took a look in the list of free registers where I had R2 and R6, and I took for the R3 as output of the instruction, the physical register R2, okay? I could have chosen also R6, would have been the same. Now, I do the execution, and after I do the execution, I'm committing the instruction. Now I'm committing the instruction, what, when I'm committing the instruction, I have to release whatever I'm not needing it. And I have to update the link between the logical registers and the physical registers in the proper way. Which means I will actually release R1, which was my input register, because I don't need it any longer. And I will update the link between R2 with R3, logically speaking. Then I started with R3 being assigned to physical register R1, and I ended up with a different assignation of <coughs> the same logical register. Okay, now you have to imagine that if I'm doing a lot of instructions per cycle, this mechanism is kind of getting complicated. But the basic is that whenever I'm getting an instruction, the input registers are already mapped in here. Then I know which are their physical registers. The output, I have to choose one from the free list, assign the output with that register. When I'm completing the instruction, I will release whatever I don't need, and I will update if required some links. Then I am playing with two two blocks, two bunch of registers. One are the logical one, the one which are seen by the programmer, <coughs> and the others are the physical ones, which are not visible with the programmer, but they are part of this <coughs> process. The physical ones are usually more than the logical ones. Remember, we said if we have 256 of them, we get a big time advantage, or not. And with this one, you are experts in dynamic scheduling, superscalar processors, VLIW processors, right? Is that the wrong assumption? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because we don't understand the hardware deeply. We don't know what the controller is. We just you know don't the main have idea. to. You design the parts only when you know the entire. And the entire, you have to build on concepts. You know, if I make a cut and I say this block has to do that, you make a design which is doing that, and I'm also telling you it has to take that calculation 20 nanoseconds, and you have to do it. But this, it's not the key in architecture. This is the key in log logic design. Okay. Then if you give me, let's say, an assignment, and you are saying, you see, I have a beautiful architecture. But I would like to have a 64-bit adder, which is doing the addition in 300 picoseconds. Then I have to find a way, because you also tell me the technology. And you may also tell me that you don't want to spend more than I don't know how many picowatts. And then I have a challenge, which is now moving in computer arithmetic. From the architecture point of view, you just see it as an adder. It's adding two numbers. Now, if I take, you know, a piece of magic cake like Alice, and I get into the adder, now I will see that there are many other things there which may help me to do better. If I can go for a ripple carry adder, I'll do it. Simple. Otherwise, I have to find, you know, a smart way to use a prefix <coughs> network for the carry. Okay. But those are not relevant for our Architects are dealing with higher level concepts. Quite sure you have to be connected to the reality because your machine has also to be implementable. Or not. Depends what you care for. Can you implement the Turing machine? Hmm? Does it make sense? But it's an elegant concept. Okay. 
you are pushing me to tell stories. <laughs> you know, and this is also a sign that I'm getting old. Because old people, they have the tendency to tell stories. <laughs> True? people which are old. <laughs> okay, now, the next ingredient that we will talk about is memory hierarchy and memory organization. Remember what I said? To compute, you need data storage, data transport, and data processing. We are essentially talking about data processing and a bit on data transport inside the processor. Now there is another part. In order for a processor to do something, it has to be fed with instructions and data to crunch. Now, simply said is I put a processor, I make a bus or a dedicated connection to the memory and then I get instruction and data from there. In theory, this is nice. But there is a problem in here, and the problem is due to this kind of difference. The technology, this is again, you know, prehistoric diagram. But the tendency is the same. There is a big difference between the speed that the logic can run at <coughs> and the speed of the memory. What you want, you want a huge memory, right? If you want a huge memory, you put a magnetic tape. It's huge, right? Have you ever saw a magnetic tape? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. We used to use them. Today we have parties, which are big. It would have been nice to have the processor, as we discussed before, associated with a huge memory, like a magnetic tape, but that one would be useless. Because to get a piece of information from the magnetic tape, I had to move the tape, you know, get to the position, read the result, which is much too slow than my machine, which was a super scalar 64-way issue machine, will do most of the time nothing. Now we have the hard disk, which is slightly faster. We have the flash, which is also slightly faster and no mechanical moves, but it's slow. We have the DRAM, which is a very effective way to implement memories on the chip. It's large enough, but it's slow and has some kind of problems like refresh. We have SRAM which is close to the speed of the logic, then the functional unit and the rest of the SRAM can run to the same kind of frequency. But then I have a problem. If I make SRAM large enough in order for my processor to work nice, or if I have even a multiprocessor that work, that will take a lot of area, and I cannot <coughs> implement it. Then we have a problem of speed, capacity, and I didn't mention, but it's also power. The more far away the data are, the more energy will cost me to bring the data. Then what I would like to do is to have the memory in the chip as close as possible to the computation facilities. Now, there is no real solution which will apply to all the cases. But there is something which people propose, and this is called memory hierarchy. <coughs> and what you would like to achieve with the memory hierarchy is to see a memory system which is very large, but slow, <coughs> within a window which can glide over that memory system 
in a transparent way and which is providing your data with the speed of the logic. Okay? Now you have here some numbers and you see if I look in a register of a processor, it takes me about 200 picoseconds to get the information from there. The numbers are again not up to date. <coughs> the proportions are there. If this is actually what the processor is seeing, the registers, then from the point of the processor, if I have always the data in the registers, I'm happy. And I would not care about how you bring the data from the other place. And this is a very happy processor. Now, in order to make the processor happy, we have to create the memory hierarchy. And you see, we implement what we call a cache, which is implemented with this run. That one, you can make it slightly larger. And it will have an access time, which is very distant. But you cannot have the capacity that you <coughs> want. And then you go to DRAM technology, where you can have, I don't know how much it's at the point. You speak about eight? gigabytes of Probably. memory or how much do you have in your process? 16. How much memory Eight. do you have? 16. I don't know. Okay, that's your DRAM. This is the memory which is, you know, kind of close to the processor but is not in the same chip most of the time. It's on the same PCB. And then from DRAM you go to up storage like input output channels which you may go to a flash solid state hard disk or to a normal hard disk. Now, as I said, the processor which is here would like to see always the data in the registers and to get the data at that high speed. If I always have the data there, I do not see the, the, the discrepancy between logic speed and memory speed. And this is the purpose of a memory hierarchy. And we do, it, we do that by caching. And caching is a structure, a hierarchical structure, and it's not invented, you know, very recent. We had caches, even old fashioned hard disks. Even the magnetic tape had a cache. Okay? And the principle of the cache is to bring some information that you expect to have, to meet in the future, in a closer buffer. And then to allow a transfer of data from the low, store, low speed storage to the high speed storage as required by the user. And the user is the processor. And now I will have to stop. And next week we will continue.